Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Life. Hey, it's so good to have you here. We're going to stand and sing and praise the Lord this morning. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. Whoa. leaders came up to them. They were annoyed that Peter was teaching about Jesus, so they put Peter and John in jail until the next day. Still, many of the people who heard their message believed in Jesus and were saved. The next day, the religious leaders got together along with the high priest and his family. Peter and John stood before them and they asked, by what power or in what name have you been healing and teaching? Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. He said to them, are you asking us about the healing of the man who could not walk? Are you asking who healed him? We want you and all of the people of Israel to know that he was healed by the power of Jesus. You nailed Jesus to a cross, but God raised him from the dead. It is because of him that this man is healed. Peter told the religious leaders that they rejected Jesus because they thought he was not important, but he is the most important one of all. The religious leaders were amazed and they didn't know what to say. They ordered Peter and John to never preach or teach in the name of Jesus again. Peter and John said, we cannot be quiet. 
We must tell people about what we have seen and heard. Good morning. And welcome to our family service at New Life. You just got a glimpse of what your kids will be learning about in their classroom today. We have a wonderful children's ministry with children from nursery to fifth grade, where they're taught the Word of God, encouraged to memorize scripture, play energetic games, and do so in a loving environment. Our teachers are excited to join you in nurturing your child's spiritual growth. We want you to know that if your little ones become restless during the service, we have a cozy mommy and me room where your child can play and enjoy a snack while you continue to engage in worship through the monitor. Thank you for being here with us. At this time, grades 1 through 5 can be dismissed. Please meet your adult leaders at the side entrance. Well, we want to say good morning and welcome to New Life. It's so good to have you worshiping with us today. We trust the service will be a blessing to you. If it's been a while since you've been with us, or maybe this is your first time, we encourage you to stop by the Welcome Center. Just let us know you're here with us today. We'd like to bless you with a gift on behalf of our ministry. But would you join me in prayer this morning as we dedicate our service to the Lord? Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together both in person and for those who are joining us online to worship you. And Lord, we ask that as we spend time in praise of you through songs, Lord, I pray that you would be glorified and honored. Lord God, I pray that as we take a look at your word and we see how it applies to our life, I pray that you would be glorified through that. Lord, as we give of our tithes and our offerings, Lord, I pray that you would get the glory. Lord, we give all these things to you and dedicate this service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we continue to worship? sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way, let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began, ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. When my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested in my life This is grace, sing it out Oh, your grace so free washes over chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom be faithfully born. and he paid for my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began oh, oh your grace so free washes over Darkness rejoice as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus rose with the freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free, wash 
Thank you. You may be seated as we go to a, the time of our offertory prayer. As you know, there are three ways you can give. You can, if you choose to give in person, you can use the receptacles in the lobby as you enter or leave through the lobby. If you prefer to give online, you can give at nlpositivefaith.com. Follow the giving links there, or the QR code will take you to that same place. If you prefer to mail in your offering, you can send to New Life Church, P.O. Box 228, Osceola, Indiana. However you choose to give, we thank you for your support uh, with our gospel ministries here at New Life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are holy. You are worthy of all our praise. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing through our church here, Lord. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for, for your goodness to us, Lord. As we bring our offerings, our tithes and offerings today, Lord, we pray that you would use them to continue to build up your kingdom, Lord. We pray that more people would come to know you through, through our offerings here, Lord, and through our work here at New Life Church. Lord, I pray for the giver also, Lord. I pray that you would continue to provide, continue to have your hand of blessing upon us, Lord. I thank you for your goodness, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Ask them to play that this morning. We're getting into the text. Greater is the one that is in me than he that is in the world. Comes right out of our text this morning. Such a beautiful backdrop to what we're going to take a look at. So I hope you walk away from the service today and that song just keeps playing in your head. Amen. Amen. 
Well, we're going to take a look at this idea that the, the Holy Spirit who resides in us is greater than he who is in the world. Who is he? Meaning forces of darkness. So there is, we believe as Christians, that there is a, a being that we know today as Satan who is in the world. He is called the God of this age, lowercase g, God of this age, not capital G, not the God, but the God of this age, the idea that he has some kind of jurisdiction here on this earth, and he has, uh, he's called um, the spirit of the air. So there's this idea that he has strong influence in our lives. And so he is so wise, and he is so cunning, and he is the ability, he has the ability to deceive like no one else ever has. I mean, he was even able to get a third of the angels of heaven to leave with him, and not just leave like heaven, but like totally buy into who he is and what he wants to do and to contradict God, to contradict Scripture, to contradict God's Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. And so how is it, how do we discern between, you know, this idea of if the Holy Spirit is in me, and there's a spiritual realm around me, what do I need to do? How do I figure that out? Well, there has to be a test. You know, I don't think there's ever been a time when somebody steps up to a microphone, they, they don't at least test the microphone, right? They, you often will hear the nine o'clock service will hear me testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, one, two, what are they doing? They're, we're checking whether or not it's coming through the system, checking whether or not it's coming through the computer online. We're checking to make sure the microphone works. If it doesn't work, there has to be a diagnostic, and we've had many different things be the problem. One time, the problem was it wasn't turned on. That's a problem. You've got to have the microphone turned on, right? One time, the batteries went dead, okay? One time, the pack, this is called, they call this the pack, okay? They call it the pack, wasn't communicating with the tower. One time, the cord itself had a short in it and wouldn't communicate. One time, the microphone was just gone, just, just dead. So when, you, when something goes wrong, you have to figure out at that moment, you've got to find out, you've got to run a diagnostic, you've got to find out why is it not working. Well, the same is true in our life when the Spirit is working in our heart, or maybe spirits are pulling us in direction. Not every, uh, not every just like fleeting thought or emotion or feeling, not, those aren't all just from God. Not every nudge that we have, not every pull in a certain direction, they aren't just all from God. And so when we have these nudges, we've got to be able to test it. We've got to run a diagnostic. We've got to understand, like, what am I dealing with here? Is this really from God or is it not? And so we're going to see that this morning. And it's kind of a tough text, and we are going to scratch the surface, like scratch it, of this idea of the spiritual realm, okay? A demonic realm and then also the angelic realm that's real, okay? So we're going to take a look at it, and the text picks up. We've been walking through 1 John. And so I hope you've been gaining a greater understanding of the book of 1 John. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to finish with the verse we left off with last week as we get into this week's text. Would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's Word? 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 24. It says, Now he who keeps his commands, meaning Christ's, abides in him, abides in Christ. And he, Jesus, abides in this person, him. And by this we know that he abides in us. How do we know that he abides in us? It's by the Spirit. Capital S, Spirit. Capital S in my Bible is helping me understand that when it was translated, it's not just any Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit of the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, whom he gave to us. Beloved, do not believe every Spirit, lowercase s, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of, is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming. Now, this is the Antichrist that we're talking about for end times. Many of us, if you've been taking a look at end times, you, th you know of the Antichrist. But he's not saying the Antichrist is here. He's saying the spirit of the Antichrist is here. It's already now in the world. You are of God, little children. Remember that, that phrase, that theme, little children, my beloved 
my beloved little ones. Remember, this is John writing to third-generation Christians, that grandfather in the faith, writing to young Christians. My little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They, meaning people of the world, are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the, as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who, does, who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You may be seated. All right, so we're going to unpack this just a little bit this morning. We're going to take a look at this in depth, this idea discerning the authentic work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the, and the Holy Spirit has to be active, has to be working in our lives as believers in Jesus Christ. But you have to understand that when God created the heavens and the earth, there were these, there were legions, there were, there were thousands and millions of these, these celestial beings that we know as angels. Lucifer, or the son of the morning, as he's called, the choir master of glory, he was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, ablaze with gems, he had a place on the holy mountain of God. And he was able to walk in the midst of the stones of fire. You and I know him today as Satan. He was one of God's most elegant beings, if not the most elegant. The leader of worship in heaven. But as he led in worship of heaven, he began be to become jealous of that worship and wanted it for himself. So he deceived a third of heaven that totally bought in with him, and he began a revolt against God. His whole MO, his whole goal is to deceive, and he's very good at it. He deceived Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. How did he get them? He deceived them by getting them to doubt the goodness of God. If I can get you to question God's goodness, he knew he could get you to dis disobey God's commands. So he got Adam and Eve to doubt God's goodness. And then they disobeyed his command. Well, not only did he deceive them in the garden, but he has been contrary to God ever since. I want to share with you just a few different ways. And this is just, I mean, we have the whole scripture that we could look at, that every time God raises up someone, Satan mounts an attack. Every time, even in modern history that we have, as God would raise up someone of great influence for the Lord, Satan would mount a counterattack. Let's think about this for a second. God raised up Abel as a godly man, a godly line that would be established there. What did he do with Cain? What did Satan do with Cain? He raised up Cain. Cain killed Abel. There was a revolt. God raised up Noah, a godly line. Then Satan raises up Nimrod, and they establish the city of Babel that revolts against God. God raised up Abraham and Isaac. Satan raised up Ishmael. God raised up David, who we know today as King David. Satan raised up the Philistine army. In modern history, God raised up Martin Luther. Help us understand faith is what we ultimately need, need, not works, faith in Christ. That's it for salvation. Satan raised up Ignatius Loyola, the leader of the Jesuits. God raised up John Wesley, godly man who loved seeing souls trust Jesus Christ as their savior. It was radical. We have the Wesleyan movement from it still here today. God raised up John Wesley. Satan raised up Voltaire and agnosticism. God raised up D.L. Moody, who his institution today is still sending out pastors and missionaries all over the world. But God raised up D.L. Moody during the same time. Satan raises up Joseph Smith to downplay the deity of Jesus Christ. Satan always is attacking. He's always mounting a counterattack against the work of God. He is in his whole MO, deceive, destroy. That's what he wants to do, deceive and destroy. He talks about the people of this world. He, you know, not everyone who is unsaved is a child of the devil. You need to know that. Not everybody who is unsaved is a child of the devil. There are children of the devil. What do you mean by children of the devil? Children of the devil are different than just regular unsaved people. Children of the devil have, they have been schooled in deception. They have been schooled and they are energized by the enemy. They want people to turn away from God. They want people to turn away from Christ. They want people not to acknowledge Jesus Christ and who he is and his deity. They, they're fueled by this. They're children of the devil. 
But not everybody who is unsaved is a child of the devil, but it doesn't make them a child of God. We know that we must trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, and then we have the right to become, become or be called, John says, children of God. So who are these people? Children of the world. What are they doing? They're, they're going about life the best they can. They recognize there's some sin in their life, and they need to do something about it, so they try to work to overcome that or try to put more good back in the world than the bad that they've put into it and they try to do these things and they recognize that there's got to be something more to life and um i don't know if you know there was like this there was a there was a big thing in the sky this week did anybody take a look at it big solar eclipse right i might be the only person that didn't look at it i'm just uh like what is wrong with him you have five retinal surgeries you're not looking at the sun i don't care who you are all right i was perfectly content handing the glasses to my kids and telling what'd you see how awesome was it you know fantastic that looks better on the news anyway all right so but here's the thing children of the world what do we do we the children of the world they see like they see creation and and what does the psalmist tell us it tells us that the creation declares god it declares the the glory of god and so i hear newscasters talk about how that you know the sun is like 400 times away from the earth and the moon just happens to be exactly you know this far away from the but it's 400 the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon and just happens to sit right it is amazing the chances of something like this happen happening the chances i'm like there's no chance that's not a chance that's on purpose that's an intelligent design by our creator our god that's what that is i heard it best described by a friend who said it's like the fingerprint of god well man how how great is that, right? It's like the fingerprint of God. How did you look at that eclipse? How did you see it? Do you see it as a fingerprint of God? Even children of the world say, man, there's a God. It's got to be good. But they, they sometimes, they're, they're deceived. They're deceived. They're, they're easy deceived because they, they know that they need to have forgiveness and they know there's a God there. And so children of the world, they, they hear the things of this world. They hear the spirits of the world. And the spirits of the world tell them, well, if you just are, are good enough, you'll, you'll be okay. God will accept you. Or if you follow this religion, it's, it'll be okay. Or God accepts all religions, it'll be okay. And that's the problem. Because we're not safe, we don't truly understand. And so as a result, children of the world stay children of the world. And if they die children of the world, even though they might be great people, they still are still separated from God. That's the problem. But see, children of the devil are used by these spirits to pull people away from God. They're used to pull these children of the world away from God. So when we have people in our lives that are against Jesus Christ or against the understanding of God or against any, anything like this in Scripture, we, we got to know not only are they not children of the world, they're children of Satan. He schooled them well. He has schooled them well. Well, I'd encourage you to write down number two. Only one spirit is the Holy Spirit. Only one spirit is the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we recognize that Satan left heaven, and he took a third of the angels with him. However, what's left over? Two-thirds of the angels are still left over. So there are, there are wonderful, wonderful angelic beings that are working out the plan of God in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. And so there is still this reality that there is, there is a, a battle going on. In fact, let's take a break from this point for just a second. Can we go to Ephesians chapter 6? I want to show you this. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, stand against his attacks. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual hosts. Okay, so there is this reality of spiritual darkness, and there are spirits about that are trying to pull us in directions against God. But there is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is working with angelic beings and working out the plan of God. And so we've got to understand that there, there is both happening here. And so we have the Holy Spirit of the living God living in us. And that's a powerful thing. So if you read the Old Covenant in the Old Testament, 
The Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit did not reside in individuals' lives. That's what makes us in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, so unique. The Holy Spirit of the living God lives in us, in our life. That's why he says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as we've talked about through this look at 1 John. We are the temple. So in the Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit would come upon people for a time, and he would leave them. Come upon people for a time, and then he would leave them. He would come upon them and help them accomplish a task, and then he would leave them. But he resided, the Holy Spirit of the living God resided in the Holy of Holies, in the temple. Well, now you and I, in the New Covenant, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so as a result, the Holy Spirit comes into our life. He never leaves. He doesn't, he doesn't walk away from us. He empowers us. He lives within us. And greater is one living in us than he that, who, that is in the world. So Satan is very powerful. Don't downplay his power, but he is not God. So let's think about who God is. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. God is not omnipotent. So that means that God is everywhere. God knows all things. God is all-powerful. Satan, while he is powerful, and while he knows things, and while he can be somewhere, he is not God. He cannot be omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere at the same time. So he uses his spiritual forces of darkness. He, can, he is not all-knowing. He knows some, but he's not all-knowing. So he doesn't know as much as God. And he is definitely not all-powerful. He's powerful. He's not all-powerful. Greater is the one living in your life than he who is in the world, meaning Satan. Only one spirit in this world is the Holy Spirit. All, of, all throughout time, there are people trying to decipher the Spirit of God. You go to a remote village, for example, you go to a remote village in Africa, and you will find spiritualists you will find uneducated tribal people that have a witch doctor in their town. And what does the witch doctor do? He drums up spirits to communicate, to heal, to help the people in the town. Well, we today, in, a, in modern United States, now that's today. Like if you were to go to a remote village today, you can find that in other tribes. That's just humanity. We're looking for God in some way or some help from spirits in some way. Today, in modern United States, we may not have that, but you know what we do have? We have people that are looking for their feelings. Now, we tell our children, don't trust every feeling, right? We say, hey, hey, hey. I know you're feeling like this right now, but don't, don't trust your feelings. 100%, there's this going on in your life and this going on in your life. It's going to get better. I can see it. But yet we as adults will say, I can't help it. I have this feeling. Or we go to seances. Like, what? Turn on TV. You can watch this. You can watch this in real time. I wouldn't actually don't watch this. Okay, God does not want you to watch this, to clarify. Students, I'm telling you right now, okay? can't go home and tell your mom and dad you want to go try to find something on TV and watch it, okay? Pastor Michael doesn't give you permission. But I will, let's, you want to read about one? Let's read about one. There's one in the, in the Old Testament. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 28, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. If not, I'll read it for you. But in 1 Samuel chapter 28, there's a crazy seance that happens. Now, many of us know about King David, but before King David, who was God's king, God's choice for a king, the people of Israel chose Saul as their king. They liked Saul. Saul was tall. That's why I didn't like him. He was tall. And they said, you know, David was short. And I was like, praise the Lord, you know. So, like, David had my heart from the beginning, right? But God, so God was supposed to be the king of Israel. They were supposed to be different from all other countries because they didn't have a king. Their king was God. Well, they said, well, we want to look like the rest of the countries in the world, God. We want to have a king. So God let them have a king. This is the problem with us Christians. We always want to look like the world. What's wrong with us? We don't want to look like the world. We want to look like the Lord wants us to look. Well, he lets them have a king. So they chose Saul. Saul was handsome. He was tall. He was wise. He was a good warrior. And everybody went for Saul. But Saul initially had a good heart. But then he walked away from the Lord. And he disobeyed God. And he started believing his own press reports. And he started acting in his own way. And he got away from 
his own humble spirit, and God removed his spirit from Saul. And it tortured Saul. Saul actually had evil spirits kind of like terrorizing him. And so he would have this young shepherd boy named David come play the harp for him to help him sleep at night. Little did he know David had been promised the kingdom. Well, here we go. We fast forward all the way to the point Saul was trying to kill David. He was trying to hunt David down because he knew that David was anointed to be the next king after Saul died. And Saul wanted his sons, he wanted his oldest son, Jonathan, specifically to be the king. Well, he finds himself, Samuel, that great prophet, had died. Look at verse 3. All Israel had cried or lamented for him, and they buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul put, had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Good for you, Saul. Great job. He, he did that. He did what God wanted him to do. But then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. Isn't that a terrifying thing when you pray to the Lord and you feel like, man, the Lord's not even answering me. He's not even talking to me. What do I do about this? So he tells his servants in, in verse 7, Find me a woman who is a medium that I may go and inquire of her. In verse 8, so he disguised himself. He put on clothes. He went and he began to talk with this woman. And he says, hey, listen, I need your help. I want to find out. I want to communicate with someone. And she's like, well, Saul has put out an edict. I'm not allowed to be here. And he goes, I promise you won't get in trouble, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, she, she goes, okay, so who do you want to talk to? He says, Samuel. Samuel had just died. So they pull up Samuel. So it says in verse 11, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. She realized, you're the king. What are you doing to me? <clears throat> he said, don't be afraid, in verse 13. He says, basically, you know, I want to talk to Samuel. In verse 15, Samuel says to Saul, Why have you disturbed me, bringing me up? Bringing me up from where? The dead. He's talking to a spirit soul here. I don't know why God allowed it, but God must have. This is, a, this is an uncertain text here to understand. It's interesting. Saul answered, and he said, I'm deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what to do. So God's not responding to me, so I'm just going to keep disobeying even more. That's what he's saying. I'm still disobeying even more by talking to you, Samuel. I know you're dead, but I'm, I'm drumming you up from this seance through this medium. And Samuel said, why do you seek me, seeing that the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he has spoken by me. So Samuel had already communicated to Saul what would happen. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute the fierce wrath upon Amalek. Look a little further down in verse 19. He says, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Whoa. Whoa. He's talking to a dead soul. And he, that soul tells him, Saul, all of your disobedience is caught up with you. Tomorrow you, not just you, and your sons will be with me. Well, what's that mean? You're about to die in battle, Saul. Saul didn't eat anymore the rest of the day. People have been trying to find out what God wants for them. They've been trying to find out how to get an edge ever since the beginning of time. And they use false spirits, evil spirits, honestly. So you got to be careful. People use seances. We even see it here in Scripture. In modern day, we have Ouija boards. I would stay away from them, teenagers. Don't do it. It'll mess you up. Horoscopes, palm readers, psychics. These are all ways that we try to decipher different spirits, but what we're actually doing is following evil spirits of darkness. Whether we knowingly or unknowingly do it, sometimes we as believers, we operate in the occult as well, 
trying to use some of these things to find out what I can have. I had somebody after the first service come up to me and tell me, like, what about the magic eight ball? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to use it, but you can try it if you want. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. Don't ask it questions, all right? If we become fixated on these things, what happens is, is our heart gets drawn in the wrong direction. So we can't trust the nudges and the promptings and the spirit of which things are happening in. How might this look in our life today? So let's, let's think about this for a second. Let's say that God is drawing someone's heart to believe in him. So God's drawing someone's heart to believe in him. You know, it says here that we ought to know who Christ is. We ought to know the gospel. All right, that's got to be central here, the gospel. Christ came in the flesh. So let's say somebody is, uh, let's say somebody's, the, the Holy Spirit of the living God is kind of drawing them. They're kind of interested in the things of Scripture, interested, interested in the things of the Word, and they're interesting, interested in like getting to know Jesus a little bit. They're trying to figure this out. And then a friend comes up and invites them to church. That wasn't an accident. The Holy Spirit orchestrated that, and the friend obeyed the Holy Spirit. Now a friend invited this person to church. And they go to that first church, and they go to church. Let's say it's Easter Sunday, and they go out there on Easter Sunday, and they, they're like, man, I heard, the, heard them preach about Jesus, how he actually came in a body. It was like God's eternal son who became a man and he went to the cross and he died for our sins, he rose from the dead. And, and I guess if you believe that he died and rose again for your sins, you have a new life, you have you have. Uh, you have a relationship with God, and they're sitting there in the seats, and the Holy Spirit's pulling them, drawing them, and they just, uh, they can't do it. They just say, no, I can't, I can't do it. I need, to, I need to look a little further into this. So they walk out. Well, they've, they've rejected the Holy Spirit in that moment. They've rejected it. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not still working, but they've pushed the Holy Spirit away. They've, they've denied God. So they go out, and they're like, I, I need to look a little more into this. So maybe they go to another church, and they go to this other church. And in this church, there's all kinds of signs and wonders. And they see people doing some crazy things. And they're like, wow, man, that's interesting. I, ah, that's interesting. I, I like what's going on here. I mean, there's some really crazy things happening in this church. And there's a lot of things happening. But they never hear the gospel. They never hear the gospel. They, they see people that are maybe even healed, or maybe they see people speak in different languages, but they never hear the gospel. They never, let me ask you a question. If they never hear the gospel, regardless of the signs that they're seeing, what spirit is in that church? It's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead you to the eternal son of the living God being his death, burial, and resurrection as the only way to salvation. No other spirit. Right? Or they... they get led to another church and like wow there's lots of people in this church it's exciting and i'm all for big churches go for big churches that's great however if, if if you're just drawn to what everybody else is drawn to and you never see or hear the death burial and resurrection of jesus christ for your sins is that church operating under the holy spirit or another spirit it's another spirit or you're drawn to another church and you say wow this is incredible here it's beautiful here and you hear that you need to work for your salvation you need to do things to be saved. And you're like, well, that kind of makes a lot of sense. And then that person's like, man, that, that makes sense here. I, I, I don't know. Is that church who never gets to the gospel and they camp on doing things for God instead of believing in Christ with spirits in that church? It's not the Holy Spirit. It's another spirit. Or maybe they go to a church and they learn how to be so motivated. Man, I'm the most self-motivated person there is. I'm part of the 5 a.m. club. I get up. I'm, I work out, I meditate, I journal, I do all this, and I feel wonderful that I'm part of this. But that church never gets to the gospel. That is not of the Holy Spirit. It's of another spirit. Or maybe they get to a church and they, they learn how to be tolerant. They learn how to accept everything that God calls as, as wrong, as sin. And we got to know that sin is sin. Otherwise, we don't know that we need forgiveness of our sins. So we need Christ to tell us what our sin is. We find it, it's more tolerant. We like this. It's more tolerant here. It's better. What spirit is in that church if we never get to the gospel? That we have sin in our life. We've got to have forgiveness of our sin. It comes through the death, burial, and resurrection of the eternal Son of the living God, Jesus. There's a spirit in that church, but it's not the Holy Spirit. 
Maybe you sing wonderful praise songs, and they're great songs. Maybe even Satan helped write some of them. Who knows? Like, what? I mean, he was a worship leader in heaven. He can probably write some wonderful songs that'll lead you almost to the throne of God, but not quite in who Jesus is. You're like, what? And the pastor shares 10 minutes, but he never gets to the gospel. There's never an explanation of the gospel. Let me tell you something. You, you have to understand that Satan, the master of deception, had at one time been in the presence of God and led worship in the presence of God, and his greatest tool are churches that bring us so close to who Jesus is, but so far away. So close, but so far away. That's what he does. There's only one spirit, only one. So we as believers, we need to be united, not just here at New Life, but believers worldwide. We have to be united on who Jesus is, on the way to having salvation in Jesus Christ. Keep the essentials, essential, as Augustine said. The non-essentials are non-essential, but the essentials have got to be essential. And that is who Jesus is and how to have salvation. Otherwise, it's being led by another spirit. And it's not the Holy Spirit. And it's not an angelic spirit. I'd encourage you to write down, use God's formula to test the spirits. Use God's formula. How do you test the spirits? You use God's formula. God gives us the formula right here. He says, every spirit that confesses in verse 2, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So you got to ask yourself, does the spirit, does this nudge, does this pull in my life, does this feeling that I have, does this thought that's going through my mind, does this pull me in the direction of Christ being the eternal son of the living God who died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins? Is this where it pulls me or does it pull me away from that? I want to just take a look at Matthew chapter 16. The Lord gives us a great example of this. Jesus is talking with his disciples. He says in verse 13, he says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? The Son of Man. They said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. I want to pause here for a second. Now, remember, who's Jesus talking about? Who do men say? Who do people of this world, not children of the devil, not even children of God yet, who do people of this world say that I am? Look at all these descriptions. Now, Satan does not want us to acknowledge Jesus for who he is. He cannot deny that Jesus is powerful during this time. He cannot deny that Jesus is incredibly knowledgeable. He was teaching the rabbis in the temple at age 12, I mean, Jesus is a very supernatural being here, and so Satan had to explain it away. So what's Satan content with? He's content with people in, in Jerusalem and Israel and Galilee. He's content with them believing that Jesus is either John the Baptist, who had already been killed, so come back. John the Baptist, Elijah, they're content. With, he's, Satan's content with people believing that he came back from the dead as Elijah or Jeremiah even or even a great prophet. Satan is content with us believing all kinds of wonderful things about Jesus as long as we don't get to who he really is, the eternal son of God. He's okay with that. Then Jesus flips the script on him. He says, but who do you say that I am? Now he gets to them. These are to be believers. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what's Jesus say to him? Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. His Father in heaven. God the Father, through God the Holy Spirit, revealed to Simon who Jesus is. That Spirit took Simon to believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. That's how you test the spirits. Does this Spirit draw me further or closer to Christ and who he is, or push me further away from who he is. The second thing is, we got to test the spirits to see if they lead us to obey the commands of Christ or disobey the commands of Christ. In verse 24 of chapter 3, it says, Now he who keeps his commands, Christ's commands, abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. The Holy Spirit abides in us and we know that he abides in us because we're keeping his commandments. 
So if you're being pulled or nudged or even thinking in a direction that would take you away from obeying Christ, you can know that if I'm about to disobey the Bible, this spirit in my life, it's not from God. It's definitely not the Holy Spirit for sure. But if it's pulling me, nudging me, drawing me to obey a command in Scripture, I can know that this is of God. So how might this look in our life? I think about it like this. Let's talk about, you know, our marriage relationships. Let's say there's a, there's a dispute in the home. Let's say that something happens and, you know, you know, I don't know, husband gets mad at wife, wife gets mad at husband, and some things shake loose, and they're sitting there. They're stewing over it, taking a break, thinking this over. It might be like the final, the final straw. It's like breaking the camel's back. Now, if that husband or wife has this thought, this, this fleeting thought of like, that's it. I can bend so far, but I can't bend anymore. That's it. I'm done. What spirit do you suppose that's from? It's not the Holy Spirit. But let's say they're sitting there like this. We need, I need to be forgiving, loving, as Christ loved the church. It'll be okay. We're going to keep working through it. Where do you suppose that spirit comes from? God. Right? Anything that's going to lead you to obey Christ is from God. Anything that's going to take you away from Christ is a, a different spirit. It's a wicked spirit. What about teenagers? You often... You might find yourself in a setting where you're like, I should not be in this room. I should not be in this house right now. I should not be here with these people. You have that gut feeling. You know that you gotta get out. You might have to text your mom and dad. You might have to call them, say, I gotta get out of here. I'm not supposed to be here right now. Where do you suppose that spirit's from? It's the Holy Spirit. But if you have that fleeting thought of like, ah, I've been pretty good. It's not a big deal. We can have a little fun. It's going to be all right. Where do you suppose that spirit comes from? It's not from God. Or maybe that child who all of a sudden hears mom's or dad's command to go clean their room, and they just feel super motivated to obey. They jump up, they run into their room, they whistle. They tell their Alexa to turn on some wonderful praise and worship music, and they clean up that room with excitement and enthusiasm. Where do you suppose that spirit comes from? Everybody's laughing because you're like, when is that going to happen? <clears throat> or that child goes in the room, shuts the door, wastes 30 minutes, pretends like they're doing things, makes just enough noise that it sounds like things are happening, kicks it all under the bed and walks out. Where do you suppose that spirit's coming from? Or about that nudge or that pull or that kind of like encouragement that you feel kind of like to go help your neighbor. You know that there's been like a little bit of a tough time or you feel like you could help them in some way. Where do you suppose that nudge is coming from? It's coming from God. What about that person that attends church and they just feel pulled to believe in Jesus? They just feel like, man, I just feel like I'm supposed to believe in Jesus. I'm having a hard time doing it, but I feel like I'm supposed to. Where do you suppose that nudge is coming from? That nudge is coming from God. The spirit of the living God wants you to become a child of God. But that, ah, not today. I need to look it up a little more. I need to do a little more research. I'm going to get online. I'm going to see what YouTube has to offer. Maybe, maybe there's something else out there. Maybe it's not Christ. Where do you suppose that comes from? It's not from God. We've been doing some remodeling on our home. I say the word we very loosely because we hired Continental Homes. There he is up there. Rick and Ricky, great people. And, uh, and he's going to laugh because I'm going to reveal something about myself. Now, here's the deal. I've, I've been told that YouTube is a great resource, a great resource for novices. Okay, It'll help you do a lot of things. Well, if you get lost on YouTube, you might think that you can do anything. Okay, And so like... I'm not sure that a day went by that I didn't call and say, I got a couple questions for you. I got a couple questions for you. I got a couple questions for you. 
all right? Some of you are like, I'll never do work for Michael, all right. <laughs> but here's the deal, here's the deal. Here's, here's where I'm going with this, though. They'd answer the phone and say, okay, uh, you cannot do that because of this. Okay, all right, that's cool, just wondering. Or you can do that, but if you do that, you got to do it this way. Okay, great, just curious, I was wondering how that works. All right, what do you need in the moment? All right, what do, what do you need? You need to validate the information you're getting. And to validate the information, I have to trust the person I'm getting the information from. And so I'm balancing just any old person online with someone I trust, the contractor. You balance it. And so in a world today where we have everything at our disposal through the internet, you've got to understand, you've got to know this, okay? Believers, you've got to know this. Not every televangelist, not every blogger, not every YouTuber for Christ, not every podcaster for Christ, not every preacher that you hear, on, they are not uh, all. Some are, and they're wonderful people. They're just not all of the Holy Spirit and of the right spirit. You have to balance it. You've got to validate it. And how do you validate it? You validate it on the Word of God. He's the contractor. You validate it here. You've got to make sure it lines up here. Does it take me to obey the commands of Christ? Okay, all right. It validates this spirit that I'm feeling in my life. It validates it. This is your contractor right here. When you feel a spirit, or you feel a nudge, or you feel an impulse to do something, check it with the contractor. That's what God wants us to do. Greater is the one living in you than he that is in the world. Just validate the spirit in which you're doing it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're here this morning and you feel the Holy Spirit kind of nudging you and pulling you in a direction to believe in Christ today. Would you just go before the Lord and say, Jesus, I believe in you as God's eternal Son who died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. Please come into my life and save me. Again, that's Jesus. I believe in you as God's eternal Son who died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. Please come into my life. Forgive me and save me. If you just talked to the Lord this morning, you just made sure of your salvation or reaffirmed your faith in Jesus Christ, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor Michael, I just made sure I knew where I was, what I was believing in today. Thank you, I see that hand, thank you. Thank you, I see that hand too, yes. I see that hand. Anyone else? Thank you. Yes, I see that hand up there. Yep, thank you. Christian friend, I got to ask you, what are you being pulled towards? What are you being drawn towards? Take a quiet moment in your heart right now. Just ask the Lord to help you decipher His Spirit. Help you to know that you're operating in Him and abiding in Him and obeying Him. Tell the Lord you need help and wisdom for when the enemy comes to deceive you. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather here together as believers, for those who are joining us online. Lord, I just thank you for that opportunity that we have. Lord, we ask that you would continue to build our lives Lord, may we be believers who are known to operate within the Holy Spirit, not to get pulled away by spirits that contradict you. Lord, I pray that you would be with each and every one of us. May we live lives of discernment. May we live lives of wisdom. Lord, ultimately, ultimately may we live lives to bring glory to you. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we close in song?
Are you glad to be in church this morning? Let's give the Lord a praise offering today. I realize that this was a, a really challenging topic. And so if you have further questions, you are not alone, okay? And so I'm welcome. I'm happy to answer as many as I can in the way that I can. And I'm, answer, I'm happy to also tell you I don't know as well. So, um, but I just want you to know, uh, I'd encourage you to take, take some time, let it digest, and think it through. And if you have questions, feel free to email the church office. I'd be happy to do what I can to help you in that way. As we go to Lord in prayer this, this morning to close our service, I'm going to pray for, we've got a lot in our midst that have uh, been, had surgery, even my own daughter, Bella's at home watching us online and praying for you, kid. Dr. Beaver did a great job this mor uh, Friday morning, and we're just thankful for the way the Lord is healing those in our midst, and I know Jim Phelps, we're praying for you at home, had uh, heart surgery this week. Clark, it's so great to see you here this morning, and my mom, who's also at home, I'm going to pray for them this morning. Would you join me in prayer for those that are in our midst 
that cannot be with us this morning. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, as we conclude our service today, we thank you for the way that you're working in each one of our lives. Lord, we know that there are some who cannot be with us, Lord, and we thank you for the way that you're restoring their health. I think of my own daughter, Bella. I think of my mom, Cindy. I think of Jim, who's at home recovering. Thank you for Clark, who's able to be with us today. Lord, we just ask that if there's anyone else in our midst, Lord, that is sick or is unable to be here, Lord, we just pray that you'd heal them quickly. And Lord, may they be able to get back to serving you with their life in the best way possible. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.